Marshall, I loved in your book how much knowledge, rich knowledge there is about gardening, but also so much of your personal history and your own connection to plants. Maybe can you tell us a little bit about your garden, your gardening journey? And I loved hearing Holly talk about trees. So maybe you can tell us about a tree that's special to, to you and your journey with loss. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm sat here in a position where I can look out on my garden, actually. Um, you can't see it because it's behind the camera, but um, it's one of my favorite spots in the house to sit for that reason. And um, so I am a, I'm a psychiatrist and a psychotherapist and have come to being an author through a relationship with this garden, actually. Um, never had any intention of <laughs> or, or never imagined myself a writer prior to to moving here and it's been a journey of really I mean there there are the book is about you know soul is a nature memoir about finding home um it really is a tale about kind of loss um and and grief and mourning a loss um as well as the kind of renewal and uh, repair and love um that kind of can come can kind of come at, at the end the other side of that journey um but the one that really interested me was relationship with place so I was born and brought up in Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean um and came to England for university never really intended to stay I fell in love um and have kind of stayed by default I suppose after that but when I had my children, I found myself really desperately seeking a sense of home and a notion of home and belonging and feeling the loss of that, realizing that I had not felt a sense of home and a sense of belonging. And I had not had a relationship with place that felt loving and meaningful um, for a long time. And I became really curious about that. And also really curious about why it is that it's not a relationship that we think about or that I had ever spent any time thinking about in my work as a therapist. I've done a lot of work around loss and grief of people, um, but had never actually spent any time thinking about relationship with, with place. And actually, relationship with place is massively important. And we kind of know that already. And we had really important evidence for that. Um, there was a little fact that I learned when I was a very baby psychiatrist that stuck with me. But, you know, in one of those ways, it kind of, I sort of forgot about it until I had my children again, and then it resurfaced. And I rem remembered how important it was. Um, and it was a little statistic about the risk of psychosis and um, the, the, the differing risks of psychosis among different groups of people here in the UK. And first generation Black Caribbean people have a nine times higher risk of becoming psychotic, developing schizophrenia in particular, than any other group. Um, and I remember finding that really startling when I learned it. And it didn't apply to me. Um, you know, as an immigrant from the Caribbean, my risk is pretty on par with, you know, a white British person. But it applies to people of my, of my children, you know, so people who are born here English but have black Caribbean heritage um and really the kind of all the research around why was about relationship with place there was something about that relationship with place that was maddening for this group of people and so when I was kind of feeling my loss of um relationship with Trinidad you know or loss of feeling a sense of home um, and became kind of really curious about it and realized that actually there were all these generational losses through my, through the generations before me. Um, and I was really interested in what you were saying about the passing on of the fruit tree, Holly, because that really resonated with a lot of the kind of themes that came up for me in writing, in writing the book that, you know, the way these, these losses can be passed on through generations and how a series of uprootings over time had left me with a real kind of almost an inability to feel at home um, because of this kind of story through the generations of people moving and having to move and um, a real kind of unsettledness and the relationship with the place that you were in being kind of temporary. Um, and I really wanted something different for my children. I wanted something very different for my children. And I felt very drawn to explore a relationship with plants 
as a way of as a way of of finding some as a way of finding my way into something new um and the kind of person that that linked with was my grandmother so I had grown up in you know kind of um extended family living is really common in Trinidad so we lived with my grandparents when I was very little and I grew up in my grandmother's garden um and she would kind of teach me things about herbal uses of plants and or she would kind of talk to me about them and you know being a kind of cocky small child I didn't necessarily take all of her advice very seriously you know I'm sort of like sure grandma yes this horrible tasting thing is good for me if you say so <laughs> um but, you know, as I've become an adult, it's been really remarkable to see some of those things, you know, proven by science. You know, one of the things that she used to love to make me drink was aloes, bitter. Aloes water is bitter. It's, it tastes horrible. <laughs> um, but she was like, this is good for you. You know, you need cooling. You, you run hot in your temperaments and you need cooling and uh, this bitter water will be good for you. Um, and then I, later in my life, I had to seek, I sought treatment from acupuncture and the acupuncturist that I saw was working in the field of Chinese traditional medicine told me exactly what my grandmother had said <laughs> that I ran hot and that I needed cooling um, and that you know these kind of bitter herbs would be would be good for me um, and then later I found you know saw aloes water selling for massively expensive amounts of money in some fancy whole food supermarket as like a superfood you know and thinking my grandmother knew what she was talking about you know um, and so we we wanted I just had this real pull to develop to to have a to have a relationship with plants and started with the house plants which you can see behind me um and then over time they just felt not quite enough I felt like I really needed some soil to root down into um and an opportunity came up for us to move to this garden um and interestingly it was linked with a with a loss um my husband got the job offer at the same time we got the news that his father was dying um and so we kind of took the opportunity to move to this place um really quite quickly so that it just felt that we needed to be closer to family that we needed to be in a place where we could um make the most of those of those last days as much as possible um and then of course COVID happened so actually you know things were scuppered and I was kind of really put into a close relationship with the place through all the kind of isolation, not being able to be in relationship with, with people. And contemplating that really brought home to me how vital it is for us as humans, um, as human animals, <laughs> who are an intrinsic and integral part of the ecology of this land, um, to have a relationship with place. And actually, how much our loss of that relationship, I think, has affected us really pretty desperately as a society, you know. Um, I think a lot of the kind of collective crises that we're experiencing at the minute um, are probably rooted in our loss of a meaningful relationship with place. Um, and so I felt called to write this book, actually, kind of to explore all of those kind of to explore those links. But in terms of grounding it in the personal, um, one of the things that, you know, there kept being lots of familiar themes coming up in this garden, really reminding me of the gardens of my childhood. And one of them was um, roses. My grandmother loved roses and she used to grow roses in her garden in the Caribbean, where they looked really sad. <laughs> um the, the Caribbean is not the not the right climate for the rose but she had been to England and had fallen in love with them on trips here and um used to grow them pride of place in her front garden at home and um, I never understood I thought they looked so sad and, and horrible um and then I moved here and I met a rose <laughs> and realized what was that she had fallen in love with um and in this garden uh, we moved in in winter and there wasn't very much that was alive. Um, you know, it's sort of, this space was very kind of difficult when we first moved in. But as it came to spring, uh, a rose kind of sprung into bloom that we didn't know was there, was sort of buried in a in a beach hedge. Um, and we just suddenly saw these beautiful white flowers kind of emerging from the hedge. And I was like, beach doesn't flower like that. <laughs> What's going on? And kind of realized that there was a rose kind of buried Um beneath the hedge 
and you know there've been there've been other plants that have kind of emerged from the soil in this garden kind of come you know kind of grown up from from where they had been kind of buried under layers of of neglect and forgetting um and seeing them come to life has been a beautiful reminder of the gardens that I grew up in and has also been a beautiful illustration of the links between these places that that we love um and it's given me the gift of being able to make myself feel at home, the relationship with this place. <laughs>